Welcome. It's good to see such a full house. Um, at first I was thinking, oh, it's going to be a rainy weekend, and then I thought, wonderful. It's going to be just the wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Um, this would be worth it whether it was rainy or sunny or whatever. Um, welcome to our second annual What in One Book, One Community Finale, with a visit from William Ken Kruger, the author of Ordinary Grace, this year's book selection. The idea for a community book week came from the Heart of Hutch's Connect Wholeheartedly Committee. Our committee's goal is to build deeper connections with the people in our community, helping us to be stronger and healthier. We felt a good way to do this was by gathering people with a shared love of reading and give them the opportunity to enjoy and discuss one book read in common. We have two other Heart of Hutch groups that are focused on becoming healthier by eating smart and moving naturally. For example, our fruit yogurt refreshments were provided by the Eating Smart Committee. Putting on this book read is truly a community partnership. This year, we received support from the I.J. Birch Family Foundation, the Friends of the Hutchinson Public Library, the McLeod County Museum, the Hutchinson Leader Newspaper, and the Public Library. We want to recognize the support they've given us and thank them. It's now my pleasure to introduce William Kent Kruger, who has joined us to talk about his book, Ordinary Grace. Although Kent's parents' claim of gypsy blood resulted in many moves before he graduated from high school, he calls Oregon as the place he came from. After a turbulent year at Stanford and meeting Diane, his wife, he headed east to plunge into the real world of work, including jobs such as logging, construction, but always writing. Luckily for us, in 1980, he and Diane made their final move to St. Paul, where, he, where they raised their family. Since grade school, Kent knew he wanted to be a writer. He made it part of his early morning routine, writing for an hour at a neighborhood cafe before heading for his job. His first published book, Iron Lake, featured Cork O'Connor, a former sheriff, part Irish, part Ojibwe, and was set in northern Minnesota. Many Cork mysteries have followed. His books have been, won many regional and national awards, and he recently sold his one millionth novel, and I think that is... He broke new ground with Ordinary Grace, a standalone novel about a 13-year-old boy who comes of age during the summer of 1961 in a small southern Minnesota town called New Bremen. Over the years, Kent has hooked us with his Cork O'Connor mysteries, but with Ordinary Grace, he has challenged us to look around for the small graces that come our way through a connected, caring community. And now, please welcome William Kent Kruger. Can you hear me? There we go. Yeah, I don't like anything between me and an audience. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction, Mary. What a pleasure it is to be here today. Uh, this is my second visit to Hutchinson. Uh, we were trying to figure out how long ago it was that I last visited. I think our best guess is about five years, which is really good. Uh, because I often tell the same stories. <laughs> so hopefully you will have forgotten them by now. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Mary particularly, who's been wonderful to work with. I want to thank everybody involved in the One Book, One Community Read program. I want to thank the, uh, the Heart of Hutch folks who have been involved in this, um, making sure that uh, everything was in place and that I could actually be here today. Um, I want to begin by asking a question, uh, and, and the question I want to ask is, uh, um, is there anybody here? who's never read a William Kent Kruger novel. That's okay, I just kind of want to show up hands. Anybody here who's never read? Oh, okay, that's okay, get out. <laughs> yeah, you walked into that one. Nah, I'm just funny with you, I'm just funny with you. I always ask that question because I never want to assume that, uh, that everybody in the audience I'm addressing knows who I am and what it is that I do. So this first uh, minute or two of remarks are for those of you who, who raised your hands. Um, so I do publish under that very literary three-name thing, William Kent Kruger, but I go by Kent 
So if we have an opportunity to talk today, uh, feel free to call me Kent. I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. I have uh, for over 30 years now with my wife of more than 40 years, my children and my grandchildren. It's a city I dearly love. Um, prior to Ordinary Grace, I was probably best known, as Mary indicated, uh, as the author of the, oh God, I love saying this, of the New York Times best-selling corporate letter <laughs> mystery series. <laughs> Which is really indicated to set up in the great north woods of Minnesota. Um, my protagonist, Corporal O'Connor, is the former sheriff of the fictional Tamarack County. He's a man of mixed heritage. He's part Irish uh, American and he's part Ojibwe. Because of that mixture in his heritage, and largely because of the area in which I've chosen to set my work, a lot of the stories that I write deal with issues that, that rise out of the interface of those two cultures, white and Ojibwe. So I've written about uh, Indian gaming casinos and the effect that that's had both on the Ojibwe population and the surrounding white population. I've written about, uh, well, the ongoing battle we have in the state over hunting and fishing treaty rights. Uh, I've written about the influx of the drug and the gang cultures on the reservation. Always at some level in my work, I deal with the whole question of racial prejudice. First book in that series was a book called Iron Lake, and uh, I began writing that when I was 40 years old. And I began writing it for one very specific reason. I was 40 years old. <laughs> yeah, it was a midlife crisis thing. I woke up one morning and honestly, it just seemed to me like my life was galloping away from me. And what did I have to show for all those years that were already lost? And where was that book? I've been promising myself forever I was going to write. Uh, a lot of my friends my age, they were going through their midlife crises, but they were, uh, some of them were addressing the, the issues in some pretty bizarre ways. I had one friend who was a, a dentist. He'd spent 20 years establishing a really thriving dental practice, which he proceeded to sell so that he could move to Colorado, to the mountains there, and as I understand it, give the guru all his money. I haven't heard from that guy since. I don't know what that means exactly. Um, I had another friend who did that really horribly stereotypic thing, how he left a perfectly wonderful family, abandoned his wife and his children, bought himself a little sports car, drove over the horizon, and it wasn't until he, he lost everything that was important to him that he realized what a mistake he'd made. So I knew those things were way too out there for me. I ended up addressing my midlife crisis in three ways. The first thing I did was, can you see this? <laughs> I wore the big one today. Uh, yeah, I got my ear pierced. Uh, now, you notice the ear I'm indicating. Those of you who understand the etiquette of male ear piercing, you'll appreciate this. So that afternoon after I had the piercing done and I got home, my very astute teenage daughter took one look at me and said, Wrong ear, Dad. <laughs> the second thing I did was to get a tattoo, which I don't generally show people unless they buy lots of copies of my books. <laughs> Or you can get me liquored up. That works pretty well, too. <laughs> and the third thing I did was to sit down and begin to write that book. I'd been promising myself forever I was going to write. Now, when I sat down to write that first book, Iron Lake, I really didn't know a lot about it. I knew three things. I knew that it was going to be a heart about a guy who was going through what I was going through, which was uh, questioning at 40 years of age everything he thought he understood about life after 40 years of living it. Uh, the second thing I knew was it was going to be set in Minnesota. Um, as Mary indicated, I'm not native to Minnesota. I didn't come here until I was about 30 years old so that my wife, Diane, could go to the U of M Law School in the Twin Cities. And before that, I really was a gypsy kid. Although I spent some time growing up in Oregon, it never felt like home to me. There was no place that ever felt to me like home. But honestly, the minute I set foot in Minnesota, I knew I found my home. I fell madly in love with this place. So I always knew that when I got serious about my writing, whatever it was, it was going to be in some way, shape, or form a homage to this adopted home of mine. And the third thing I knew about it, and boy, are you going to love this, I knew it was going to be set in the dead of winter. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get winter until I moved to Minnesota. <laughs> But after I'd, I'd experienced my first true Minnesota winter, I couldn't wait to share that knowledge with the world. <laughs> Seriously, one of the things I did set out to do in that first book, Iron Lake, was to write a story. And it, and it wouldn't matter whether people uh, took that book with them on, uh, on vacation uh, in Hawaii or California or Florida or someplace, and, and they read it on the beach while the sun was beating down on their backs. They could, just from reading what I put in the pages of that novel, 
know what it was like to stand outside on a day when the wind chill was 50 below and you were cold to the bone. Uh, I like did really well for me, sold lots of, sold lots of copies, uh, won lots of awards. It was the first of my novels to be optioned by Hollywood. That was followed by Boundary Waters, Purgatory Ridge, Blood Hollow, Mercy Falls, Copper River, Thunder Bay, Red Knight, Heaven's Keep, uh, Vermilion Drift, Northwest Angle, Trickster's Point, Tamarack County, and last fall, number 14 in the series, Wendigo, or if you're Ojibwe, Wendigo Island. Okay. So along there somewhere, I had the chance to write a couple of books that weren't part of my series. Uh, many years ago, I wrote a, what in the business we call a standalone thriller, a book called The Devil's Bed. And, uh, and uh, in the spring of 2013, I published a novel called Ordinary Grace. Ordinary Grace, which is, which is why I'm here today. Ordinary Grace is your one book, one community read. You know, I've got to tell you, I love it. I love the idea of an entire community gathered around a discussion uh, of a single book, especially if it happens to be mine. Uh, uh, I was talking with, uh, with uh, the Heart of Hutch folks this morning, and they told me something that I'd never realized before, but reinforced my, my belief in this one book, one community read. They were telling me that, that even more than good nutrition, even more, am I correct in this, even more really than, than that active lifestyle, the social the vital social connections that you maintain in your life is the most important protective factor against heart attacks. You know? So, even more reason to have a one book, one community read. You know, it keeps you healthy. Um, I, uh, you know, Ordinary Grace has been chosen as a one book, one community read uh, lots of places. I was in Salt Lake for a one book, one community read there. I was in Chicago uh, last fall for the same thing. I've been in uh, northern Minnesota, Iowa. Um, and, you know, I, in all of these places, as I'm anticipating going there to participate in this one book, one community read, I can't help imagining that in that community, while the while one book, one community read program is going on, that maybe the folks in that community, when they like, you know, go to the grocery store and they're standing in the checkout line, instead of reading the tabloids and, and finding out whatever crazy shenanigans the Kardashians are up to that week, <laughs> instead maybe they're talking to one another. And they're talking about a book. I love imagining that. Um, and then I thought, well, well, why stop with the one book, one community read? Why not? a one book, one state read. Well, Wonder of Grace has been chosen for South Dakota's one book, one state read. So I'm very pleased with that. But I'm thinking now, why stop there? <laughs> why not a one book, one nation read? Why is a nation? We all gather together as one large community to discuss a book that we feel has, has value to us as a people. And then I thought, well, why stop there? <laughs> What if in this country, you know, we just came through uh, not too long ago that whole Super Bowl thing. What if in this country we had the Super Bowl of books? What if we had this huge event every year um, where the finest, uh, the finest published uh, uh, offerings of that particular year battled it out for literary supremacy? And you know how in how in the, in, the, in the weeks leading up to the to the Super Bowl you have the playoffs? What if in the Super Bowl of books we had book offs? And so every every week some books would be eliminated. But as that book that you were championing made it through all of those weeks and got closer and closer to that final event, you got more and more excited. And what if on the day of the Super Bowl of books, our televisions instead of being filled with uh, all these advertisements about Cheetos and, and, and dog food and, you know, cars and things we don't really care about. What if every commercial was about a book? Wouldn't that say an enormous amount about who we are as a people? Yeah. I know, dream on. <laughs> but honestly, God, things don't happen unless you start by dreaming. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm here to talk about Ordinary Grace, so let's talk about Ordinary Grace. You know, um, I have a pretty good standing in the, in the education community here in Minnesota. A lot of my books are on recommended reading lists for high school students. So it's not uncommon for me to be asked to speak to high schools. Um, I don't know, 
I, those of you who have had teenage children or have dealt with teenagers on a regular basis will understand this. Teenagers are the most difficult audience I ever address. Because, you know, teenagers, it doesn't matter how interesting they might really think what you're telling them is. They, give you, they always give you that look like, yeah, whatever. You know, you know the way, you know the way. So I was invited to speak to a rural high school uh, in, uh, in southwestern Minnesota last year. I accepted the invitation. I went down and I delivered my remarks. And then I opened it up for questions, as I always do. The first question came from a young lady in the front row. She raised her hand. I called on her. This was her question to me. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of blindsided me. So I got the pot a little bit and finally confessed to the fact that I'm 64 years old. Um, when the assembly broke up and all the students went their separate ways, she came up to me and she proceeded to, uh, to explain to me the reason for her question. She was a writer and she wanted to know how long it was going to take her to make her living as a writer. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to break her heart. <laughs> so I gave her the advice I always give my writing students. Have patience. Be patient. When the time is right, these things will come to you. I'm telling you that story uh, in large measure because a great deal of what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon is predicated on the fact that I'm 64 years old. And I want to talk about how at 64 years of age, I've finally seen two very important journeys in my life come together in a very satisfying way. I'm talking about my journey as a writer, and I'm talking about my spiritual journey. And the place they come together is a novel called Ordinary Grace. I don't know how old you were or what the circumstances might have been when you first realized that there's a great deal more to existence than we see with our eyes. For me, it was at the age of six, and it was the result of seeing a movie called The Incredible Shrinking Man. <laughs> Anybody here remember The Incredible Shrinking? Oh, I'm so happy to see some hands go up. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who, uh, who uh, have no idea what I'm talking about, The Incredible Shrinking Man was one of those great science fiction movies that was all over the big screen back in the 1950s. It's about this guy who uh, goes boating off the coast of California, and while he's out there on the ocean, he happens to pass through this very strange, mysterious, luminous mist which, of course, turns out to be a radioactive mist because everything in the great B science fiction movies of the 1950s was the result of radioactivity. And uh, a couple of, uh, a few weeks after he passes through that, uh, that mist, he begins to shrink. And the smaller he gets, the more his perspective of the world changes. So he gets to the size of, like, uh, uh, the Munchkins and the Wizard of Oz, and he sees the world as little people see the world. He gets even smaller, and he gets to the point where the family cat, who used to look to him for food, looks at him as food, you know? He gets really tiny, and he ends up battling a spider over a dropped crumb of birthday cake because he's starving to death. Right near the end of that movie, he's so tiny that he slips out of the house through the mesh on the window screen. And right at the end of that film, he is so minute that he enters existence on a molecular level. And do you know what he discovers? There's a universe there, too. And so what I understood when I walked out of that movie theater at 6 was, uh, was life, existence was a great deal larger and a great deal smaller and a great deal more mysterious than I was probably ever going to be able to grasp. So that's sort of uh, what I date my own spiritual journey to, that, that movie at 6. And after that, probably like a lot of you, uh, my spiritual journey was pretty much shaped by my religious upbringing. And uh, maybe like a lot of you, when I graduated from high school, I thought uh, it was time to put my spiritual journey behind me. I graduated in 1969, and I see some contemporaries out here. So you guys remember the world that we graduated into in 1969. It was a culture dominated by three things. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know? A really tough combination for the spiritual journey to compete with. So I thought it was time to put my spiritual journey behind me. But I have never put behind me my journey as a writer. I have always wanted to write, and I have always written. Blame my folks for that. I blame everything on my folks. Um, but I blame them because when I was a kid, they read to me. When I went down, I never went down for a nap. I never went to bed at night. 
without a story being read to me. So I grew up thinking of the world in terms of stories, and for whatever reason, I always wanted to be one of the storytellers. Um, well, here's a quick one for you. The first story I remember writing was a short story in the third grade. It was called The Walking Dictionary. My father acted it as my father was a high school English teacher. And he was, uh, he, any English teachers in the group? Oh, God bless you guys. So, I don't know about you, but my father was always storming around the house ranking something like, nobody uses dictionaries enough, nobody uses dictionaries enough. So in the third grade I wrote this short story called Walking Dictionary, which was in fact about a dictionary that didn't think it was being used enough, magically sprouted legs so that it go, uh, could go out into the world and, and go to the people that needed it. My third grade teacher oohed and awed over that story. My folks oohed and awed over that story. Honestly, in the third grade, I knew, I knew I was going to be a writer with a capital W. <laughs> so I've always wanted to be a writer, and I have always written. Would you like definite proof of this? Nod your heads politely is what Minnesotans do. <laughs> okay, here's a poem I wrote in the fifth grade. Poem I wrote in the fifth grade. It's called The Lone Wolf. It goes like this. The moon was hidden behind a cloud. The shadows were gone when came aloud the clear, keen voice of a wolf that day, while still asleep in bed I lay. Suddenly, I awoke with a start, and felt the rapid beating of my heart, and heard the howling lone wolf's cry, and saw the black clouds in the sky. Then, lo, the shining moon came out, and shone on the land round about, and the silhouette of a wolf I saw. It was then that I said, jaw. I hunted that wolf day and night, whether rain or the sun shone bright. I didn't stop to rest or play. I hunted that wolf every day. I never did catch up with him. He could run. His body was slim. But I tell you, even to this day, from someone, he is running away. Thank you very much. <laughs> So I've always wanted to be a writer, and I've always written, but I thought I'd put my spiritual journey behind me, and then I began to write the Coco Connor series. And the more I wrote those, those stories, the more spiritual questions began to bubble up in the plots that I created. Um, for those of you who know the Cork O'Connor series, you know that uh, that Cork is a man with a foot in two different spiritual traditions, his white Catholicism, he's Irish Catholic, and his Ojibwe spirituality. And in the stories, he's very often trying to figure out where his own individual spiritual path lies. And I began to realize that was still a concern for me, a deep concern for me. And then about seven years ago, a story idea came to me that wasn't a Cork O'Connor story. And because it wasn't a Cork O'Connor story, I knew if I wrote it, it was going to be a very risky proposition. For this reason, several years ago, my publisher called me out to New York City, sat me down, and they said, Kent? We only want Cork O'Connor stories from you. And they did that for this reason. I told you the other book that I've written that's not a part of my series was a standalone thriller called The Devil's Bed many, many years ago. Anybody here read The Devil's Bed? Oh, that's wonderful. You are the only people in the whole world who did read <laughs> The Devil's Bed. Readers stayed away from it, not because it wasn't a good book. It got great reviews. Readers stayed away from it because Cork O'Connor wasn't in it. Yeah, exactly. And readers were unwilling to follow me to a place that didn't have cork. And that's when my, after that sale debacle, my publisher called me out to New York and said, Ken. So I knew if I spent time writing this story that wasn't Cork O'Connor's story, it was going to be great, a great risk. Clearly, my publisher wasn't interested. I didn't have, uh, have an idea anybody else would be interested. But in the end, I had no choice. It was a story that spoke to me in such a powerfully compelling way that I had to write it. So I cleared the decks, and over the course of the next three years, I wrote the manuscript for Ordinary Grace. Now, for those of you who haven't read Ordinary Grace, it's, it is very different from my Cork O'Connor series. It's set in the summer of 1961 in a small town deep in the very beautiful Minnesota River Valley. It's the story of a Methodist minister whose beloved child is murdered. That's the compelling mystery component. But at heart, it's really the story what that terrible tragedy does to this man's faith, his family, 
and ultimately the, the entire fabric of this small town in which he lives. When I look back on the writing of that novel, it seems to me I wrote it for two very specific reasons. And the first was this. I'd wanted for a long time to write a book that would allow me to go back and recall an important period in my own life, the summer I was 13 years old. I don't know what being 13 years old is like for the women in this group, but for guys, it's an important period. We're standing in a threshold. We have one foot still firmly planted in our childhood and one foot poised to take us forward into our manhood, but we're not ready to go there yet. Uh, for a lot of reasons, across the whole course of my life, I have vividly remembered the summer I was 13 years old. So I wanted to, to be able to go back and recall it and invoke it in such a way that I could put it in the pages of a book, and even readers who were born decades later could read that story and know what it was like to be a 13-year-old boy in a small Midwestern town in the summer of 1961. So that was one motivation. And the other was simply this. I wanted to write a story that would allow me to explore more deeply the whole question of the spiritual journey in our lives. Honestly, I, uh, I put everything I know about storytelling into Ordinary Grace. I think it's the best thing I have ever written. It may be the best thing I will ever write. So where is it uh, that I come to in this 64-year spiritual journey of mine? I'm going to read a, a brief passage from Ordinary Grace that I think says as well as anything that I put in the book what I wanted to convey to the reader and the way in, in which I wanted to convey it. For those of you who haven't read Ordinary Grace, it's narrated by Frank Drum, uh, who was 13 years old in the summer that the events of the, of the story take place. Frank's Father Nathan Drum is the Methodist minister in the small town of New Bremen, Minnesota. Um, Frank has a younger brother, Jake. And at one point in the story, Frank and Jake stumble across the body of a dead man beneath a railroad trestle at the edge of town. The man is homeless. He's an itinerant. He's what, when I was a kid, we would have called a bum or a hobo. And because he's unknown to anyone in the town, he's slated for a pauper's burial in the local cemetery. Present at that burial are Frank, his father Nathan, who's been asked to give a brief service for this unknown man. The county sheriff is there, the mortician is there, and also a guy named Gus. Now Gus is an important character in the story. He's a good friend of the Drum family. He's a guy who earns his living doing all kinds of odd jobs uh, around New Bremen. Among them, he takes care of the cemetery. He waters the grass and keeps it mowed, and he digs the graves for the people who are going to be buried there. In the early afternoon, my father got himself ready for the burial of a man we'd all begun calling simply the itinerant. And I told him I wanted to go along. He asked my reason, and I tried to articulate my thinking, although the truth was that I didn't really know. It simply felt right. I had been the one to bring the body to light and it seemed fitting that I be there when it was delivered into a darkness eternal. I tried to say as much, but knew, even as I spoke, that I was saying it all wrong. In the end, my father studied me a long time, and finally allowed as he saw no reason for me not to be there. His only requirement was that I dress as I would for the funeral of someone we knew, which meant my Sunday best. My father drove the packer to the cemetery, which was set on a hill on the east side of town. The hole was already dug, and Gus was waiting, and Sheriff Gregor was there, though I didn't know why. And moments after we arrived, Mr. Vanderwall drove up in the hearse, and my father and Gus and the sheriff and the mortician slid the coffin from the back. It was a simple box of pine, planed and sanded smooth, and it had no handles. The men lifted and carried it on their shoulders to the grave. They laid it on wooden two-by-fours that Gus had arranged across the opening, along with canvas straps for the eventual lowering into the earth. Then the men stood back, and I with them, and my father opened his Bible. It seemed to me a good day to be dead, and by that I mean that if the dead cared no more about the worries they'd shouldered in life and could lie back and enjoy the best of what God had created, it was a day for exactly such. The air was warm and still, 
and the grass of the cemetery which Gus kept watered and clipped was soft green, and the river that reflected the sky was a long ribbon of blue silk. And I thought that when I died, this was the place exactly I would want to lie, and this was the scene that forever I would want to look upon. And I thought it was strange that a resting place so keenly had been given to a man who had nothing, and about whom we knew so little that even his name was a mystery. And though I didn't know at all, and still do not, the truth of the arrangement, I suspected that it was somehow my father's doing, my father and his great embracing art. He read the 23rd Psalm, and then he read from Romans, ending with, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He closed the book and said, We believe too often that on the roads we walk, we walk alone, which is never true. Even this man who is unknown to us was known to God, and God was his constant companion. God never promised us an easy life. He never promised that we wouldn't suffer, that we wouldn't feel despair and loneliness and confusion and desperation. What he did promise was that in our suffering, we would never be alone. And though we sometimes, and though we may sometimes make ourselves blind and deaf to his presence, he is beside us and around us and within us always. We are never separated from his love. And he promised us something else, the most important promise of all, that there would be surcease, that there would be an end to our pain and our suffering and our loneliness, that we would be with him and know him, and this would be heaven. This man, who in life may have felt utterly alone, feels alone no more. This man, whose life may have been days and nights of endless waiting, is waiting no more. He is where God always knew he would be, in a place prepared. And for this, we rejoice. My father led us in the Lord's Prayer, and we stood in silence for a few moments, staring down at the simple coffin which was pale yellow against the black of the hole beneath. And then my father said something that amazed me. He said, it's a good day to be dead, which were almost the exact words I'd been thinking. And he said, let this man in this place of beauty rest forever in peace, which was also very nearly what I'd been thinking. And he nodded to the other men, and they each took a strap end. The mortician said, Frank, when we lift, would you please remove the boards? They lifted, and I bent, and slid the two-by-fours from underneath, and the men slowly lowered the coffin. When it was settled, they drew the straps back up, and my father said, Gus, would you like a hand? No, Captain Gus said, I've got all day, and I intend to take my time. My father shook hands with the sheriff, and with the mortician, and we returned to our vehicles, and left Gus to the duty of sealing the grave with the dirt he'd removed to create it. So, what is it, what is it that I, uh, I believe after 64 years of my own spiritual journey? Where is it that I am now on this journey? Here it is. It's really very simple. I believe that there is a great spirit that runs through all creation and connects all creation, no matter how large or how small. And some people call the spirit God. Some people call it Allah. The Ojibwe call it Kichimanadu, the Great Spirit. Or I love, even better, the, the more poetic translation, the Great Mystery. And when we're born, we come out of that Great Spirit, out of that great loving heart. And while we're here in this, in this flesh, on this earth, we're never alone. That Spirit is always with us. And when we die, we simply go right back from where we came right back into that great spirit, right back into that great loving heart. That's it. That's all I read. 
I told you it was simple. Uh, I just have one more thing to say. For those of you who have read and enjoyed Ordinary Grace, I'm at work now. Uh, I'm completing the revisions for a companion novel to Ordinary Grace, uh, which will be called This Tender Land. This Tender Land. I call it a companion novel because it's not a sequel. It doesn't deal with the Drum family, nor does it take place in New Bremen. But like Ordinary Grace, it's also set in southern Minnesota, as opposed to my court work, which is northern Minnesota. And it's also set in an earlier time. Ordinary Grace is the summer of 1961. This tender land takes place in 1958. So there's good news and bad news. If you like Ordinary Grace, the good news is there's a companion novel that will be coming out. The bad news is it won't be out for a year. <laughs> it won't be out until the spring of 2016. And then for those of you who like my Corp O'Connor series, the next in the Corp O'Connor series, will be out the following fall, the fall of 2016. So those are my prepared remarks uh, this afternoon. If you have any questions, I've been asked to save some time for those. So, uh, so this is the time to ask the questions. And if you don't ask now, you're kind of out of luck because I'm never coming back to Hutchinson. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you have any questions about Ordinary Grace or the Corp O'Connor series, uh, Hollywood anything, you just go ahead and ask. Yeah. Well, Gus is, a num is one of a number of characters who came out of my own experience. These are people I knew. So peek behind the curtains here, folks. Um, a lot of the people who have been important in my life uh, are in this book. The Drum family is my family. Uh, my father wasn't, uh, wasn't a small town Methodist minister, but he was a high school English teacher in a small town. And those of you who know small towns, um, you know that that teachers, ministers, bankers, these are people who, who are scrutinized a little more closely by community and their families are scrutinized a little more closely. So I understood that. Um, Ruth Drum, Nathan Drum's wife, Frank's mother, is uh, a woman not happy at all being a minister's wife. It wasn't what she signed on for. When she married Nathan, she thought she was marrying uh, a guy who was going to be a hotshot lawyer. Nathan goes away to the war, is so traumatically changed by that that he comes back and he becomes a Methodist minister instead. That's not what she wanted her life to be about. She's an artist. She wanted to live an artistic life. But what does she have to do? She has to be a minister's wife, and she has to raise children. Um, that was my mother. <laughs> my mother graduated from Drake University in Des Moines with a dual degree uh, uh, in, uh, in music and in drama. Oh my god, was she a drama queen? <laughs> And she had this ethereal voice, beautiful voice, and she could work magic on a keyboard. She wanted to be an artist. She wanted to go out there and do that. But what did she have to do? She had to raise four children. Because when my mother uh, was married, that's what the women were expected to do, to be the homemakers. My mother did not want to be a homemaker, and she was horrible at it. <laughs> she was a legendarily bad cook. So that's Ruth Drum. Uh, Ariel and Frank and Jake, those are, that's pretty much a reflection of, uh, of my brothers and my sister as I was growing up. Gus is one of those characters who came out of my own work experience. I worked construction and lumber and uh, logging for many years uh, before I found an inside job. I like working outside a lot better, let me tell you. But I worked, with, I worked with Gus. Actually, I worked with several Gus's, but there was one specific guy. And you're right. Gus had wisdom. Gus also had a drinking problem. Gus couldn't keep a job. Gus traveled around a lot. He, he had nothing to hold him to one particular place. But Gus, the Gus I knew, um, offered me all kinds of incredible insights about the world because he had experienced the world in ways I hadn't at that point even begun to imagine. Um, and Gus was also a guy I could count on. Gus was a guy I knew had my back. So I created Gus. And Gus, for me, represents what a story, a good story, ought to be about. A good story ought to be a journey. At the end of that story, your characters, um, your understandings as a reader, my understanding as a, as a writer ought to be in a different place than when you began that, that story, when you begin reading that story, when the characters begin being a part of that story. And Gus, 
keep losing it here. Gus, it, watch Gus. There's a transformation that takes place in that man. He's come back from the war, and he's kind of a reprobate. I mean, we meet him, and he's puking in the minister's car. <laughs> it doesn't get much worse than that. But over the course of the story, when he's asked to step up and fulfill this need, mentoring these boys, even in, 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 in a way taking Nathan's, assuming Nathan's role as father, because Nathan is so involved in other things, Gus does that. Gus proceeds to become the man I think he was always capable of becoming. So that's Gus, and I love the arc of Gus's uh, development. There's another character in the story who's intriguing to me and who came out of my own experience, and that's the cop Doyle. You guys remember the cop Doyle? What a creepy guy he is. Yeah, you know, I'm writing Doyle, and I have no idea when I'm writing the stuff that Doyle does, why Doyle does this, because the Doyle I knew was exactly like that. I worked one summer in a, in a cannery in Oregon uh, to earn money for college, and Doyle was my crew boss. And Doyle was this kind of guy who would, he could tell the raunchiest jokes imaginable. Um, and I, I thought I had heard them all, but boy, this guy, ugh. Oh. And, he, and he, would, he would do things that would just make you hate him. And then in the next instant, he would turn around and do, and do the right thing. And he just, I never had an, uh, any idea when he was going to do one or the other. And so when I created this cop that I wanted readers not really ever to get and to wonder about, I used Doyle. I used Doyle right out, of, right out of reality, right out of my own experience. And I think that's one of the things that makes Ordinary Grace such an important story for me. It's so much about my life, the things I observed, the people I experienced. Um, I tap the deep roots of my own experience for this book. Thanks for asking. Yeah, yeah. The question, yeah, the question is, uh, what's the source for uh, the Ojibwe information that I offer when I'm writing one of my Corporal Connor stories? Here's how that whole thing came about. Uh, the first decision I made. Okay, so I told you I'm not native to Minnesota, uh, but the first one of the first things my wife and I began doing when we moved here was what everybody in the Twin Cities does. We began vacationing up north, you know, got out of Dodge and vacationed up north. We began spending a portion of every summer at a YMCA camp north of Edie, a place called Camp de Nord. Anybody here know Camp de Nord? Okay, great place. It's literally across the road from the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. And when I discovered that remarkable territory, I thought, oh my god, somebody should be writing stories about this place. So I always knew, when I got serious, that's where I was going to set my work. When I took a really good look at the North Country of Minnesota, I realized you, you, it would be very difficult to tell a true story set up there without somehow including the Anishinaabeg as an element, because the influence, their influence up there is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So I decided, OK, I'm going to, I'm going to bring the, the Ojibwe into this story. I didn't know a thing about them. Honestly, I didn't. But I was a cultural before I got kicked out of Stanford, I was a cultural anthropology major. And so the idea of learning about a culture on my own was really exciting. And I began by doing what every good academic does. I began by reading, read everything I gave my hands on. Then in the course of all of that, I met a number of members of the Ojibwe community who become uh, uh, friends, uh, trusted resources over the years. Now, whenever I have an opportunity, uh, when my deadline will allow me, I, I have Ojibwe readers read my, my manuscripts to vet them for me. So it's a good relationship I have with them. It's, it's, t it's taken years, really, to develop. What else? Yeah. Oh, that's such a good question. Are you you're looking for it? That eureka moment? I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, OK. Here's the, what a great observation. The question is, OK, so I went through my midlife crisis. I got the piercing. I got the tattoo. And then I sat down, and I, and I wrote Iron Lake. Was that my eureka moment? Was that the gestalt, that moment of gestalt? Yeah. It really was. Honestly, it was. I've been trying to write forever. I've been trying to write a novel, really, for a very long time. But I've been trying to write the great American novel. As Ernest Hemingway might have written the great American novel. My father, the high school English teacher when I was 18 years old, insisted I read Ernest Hemingway, and I fell madly in love with this guy. Uh, really, 
Yeah, I liked his writing. It was just fine, but I fell madly in love with this mythic image of Ernest Hemingway. There was this guy who was, uh, you know, he'd been wounded. Uh, he was an ambulance driver, been wounded in World War One, become a famous correspondent. He hung out with matadors. He was a legendary brawler and drinker, big game hunter. And he'd been given the Nobel Prize for writing a kind of fiction nobody had ever written before. So when I was 18 years old, I wanted to be Ernest Hemingway. And I tried for years and years and years to write the great American novel, a la Ernest Hemingway. Really stupid idea, I know. When I went through my midlife crisis, it just it occurred to me that it wasn't me. That's not who I am. Who are you? What do you want to do? And I thought, well, the one thing I want to do is I want to write a story somebody's actually going to want to read. So I looked around me to see what people are reading. And you know what people read? Mysteries. Exactly. People read mysteries. It's a, it's a genre that cuts across all socioeconomic levels. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to write a mystery. And in that, that one of the things that decision did was it lifted the, that horrible weight of trying to write the great American novel off my shoulders. And I just felt liberated. I felt free. And when I began to write the Cork O'Connor stories, it was as if, particularly because they were Minnesota, and I loved Minnesota, and I knew Minnesota, Everything began to feel right for me. That's when it all came together. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Great question. What else? Yeah. <laughs> Jake? Yeah, Jake. Oh, good, good, good. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> you know, Jake, um, I, I, I'm often asked, where did, where did Jake and that stutter come from? Um, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. What happens when you write a story is you try to open yourself to the full imagining of that story. And, and if you do that, then you, you're, you're tapping something that's beneath your conscious thought. And so when I was in the opening of that book, I knew I wanted these two brothers. And I knew there was going to be something different about Jake. I thought maybe he was going to be a little slow, or maybe I couldn't quite figure it out. And then I'm writing that opening scene in which uh, Nathan Drum gets the phone call in the middle of the night to go uh, spring uh, Gus from jail. Frank gets up and he goes back to, to, the, to the bedroom where now Jake is also awake and they start having this discussion and Jake gets really pissed at, at Frank and I'm, as I'm writing it, Jake stutters and I'm going, oh, where did that come from? That's so interesting. And so I began to, I had to do a lot of research about stutterers uh, to make sure I got it right and I understood it, but uh, that's, yeah, that's where Jake came from. Yeah, me too, me too. Jake's the hero in this story. Jake is the hero of Ordinary Grace. What else? Yeah. The question is, do I have any input at all in terms of the audiobooks, who reads them? And the answer is no, I'm just the author. <laughs> and, um, uh, the, all of the, the, the people who publish these things are just huge. And uh, although I can, I can offer my input, I'm generally speaking not paid any attention to. Uh, so, so actually, so no, I don't. They used to ask me, they used to send me, for any of you who have listened to my audiobooks, and you have trouble when they mispronounce something in Minnesota badly. Yeah. They used to actually send me a list of words to make sure that they got them right. They don't do that anymore. And so, yeah, anybody who's from Minnesota cringes sometimes. They're read well, but when they get it, up, when they get it wrong, it just stands out like that. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Maria Grand in... Uh, in uh, <laughs> Was that pretty for No, that was Boundary Waters. Boundary Waters. So I, I actually auditioned. You know, I'm not a bad reader. I think I read pretty well. So I actually asked if I could read my own stories. So this, this was when I was with a company called Brilliance, big, big audiobook company. And they said, well, sure, come on out and audition. So they're out in Grand, yeah, they're out in Grand Haven, Michigan. They, uh, I went out with my wife, and they put me in this booth, the recording booth. This was for Thunder Bay. And they said, okay, can't start reading. So I began reading from the beginning of Thunder Bay. And the beginning of Thunder Bay is primarily expository, and I'm doing fine with that. And they said, okay, Kent, let's, uh, let's go to a place that has lots of dialogue. So they marked a place they wanted me to read where several people are speaking uh, all at once. And suddenly I realized why they have professional readers do this stuff. Because my men sounded like my women, my children sounded like my adults. And when, when you've got a good reader, 
Think about this. There are numerous voices involved in a story, and that reader has to give each voice something unique and different about it, and maintain that across the whole course of the work. That's just amazing. I know lots of uh, actors now who do the, the readings of books, and uh, I, I admire greatly what they do. I just wish they would talk to me about pronunciations. Yeah, All their Ojibwe words are always wrong. Yeah. What else? Yeah. I know that you mentioned you really like the book Kill a Mockingbird. Uh -huh. I taught that another time. Oh, good for you. <laughs> You know, yeah, so here's the question. Uh, to Come Mockingbird is still my favorite American novel, and the question is, and this wonderful English teacher, so what, what, uh, what level were you teaching To Come Mockingbird at? 10th grade. 10th grade, perfect. I, I come across so many, I talk to lots of college students, and that's one of the questions I ask. So how many of you have read To Come Mockingbird? I can't tell you. Okay, how many of you have read To Come Mockingbird? <laughs> Do you know, I've talked to college English classes, and hands don't go up. And I think, what a travesty, what a travesty. But today, do you know, if I'm not reading a mystery, because I love reading mysteries, if I'm not reading a mystery, I tend to read Midwestern authors. Uh, because I think a case can be made that there is, in fact, a Midwest voice in literature. It's a very spare voice, but very eloquent. And I think it's, it arises out of an understanding of our connectedness to this land we occupy. So if you know the work of Marilyn Robinson, Gilead, most recently Lila, um, I love her work. Uh, uh, John Hassler, wonderful Minnesota author. Uh, Kent Harrop, if you know his work, Plain Song, Even Tide, most recently Benediction. There's a, there's a wonderful writer nobody's ever heard of. Anybody here know the name Kent Myers? Kent Myers? Okay. Put this guy on your reading list. This guy grew up in southwestern Minnesota. I first, uh, he teaches now at uh, Spearf in Spearfish in South Dakota. I first learned about Kent Myers because when my first book, When Iron Lake came out, I got this call one night, and this very lovely woman on the other end said, uh, Mr. Kruger, I represent the Friends of the American Writers Prize, and I'm going, never heard of it. She's saying, we, we just want, I, I learned later that the Friends of the American Writers Prize is this really prestigious thing. Toni Morrison has won it, uh, Carl Sandburg has won it. And she said, I just want to let you know that you've won the Friends of the American Writers Prize. And I went, well, great. She said, well, actually you came in second place. <laughs> it was won by Kent Myers for his book, The Witness of Combines. And I thought, oh great, I lost to a farm book. <laughs> and I proceeded to read The Witness of Combines by Kent Myers, and I have never read a better collection of essays on what it was like to grow up on a hard scrabble farm in southwestern Minnesota. When Kent Myers was 16 years old, his father, right at planting time, uh, died of a brain aneurysm, suddenly like that. And Kent and his brothers and his sisters had to do what their father taught them in terms of how to run a farm. So they had to plant, they had to oversee everything. And, and while this is going on, all of the surrounding farmers, all these old guys, experienced farmers, knew, knew his father, stand back and let these sons and daughter do what the, what the father taught them to do. And, uh, and then at harvest time, they all show up with their combines to help bring in the crop. Beautiful, beautiful series of essays. Um, I recently read a book called The Work of Wolves by Kent Myers, and I don't think there's a better writer at work in our, in our American um, literature scene to, today. So put Kent Myers on your, on your radar. Another great one here in Minnesota that probably none of you know is Thomas Maltman. Anybody here know Tom Maltman, his work? Little Wolves, set not too far from here. Read Little Wolves. Okay, off my soapbox. Uh, what else? Yeah. Do I have a lot of the characteristics of Frank? Frank is so much braver than I ever was when I was. Frank is kind of an amalgam of me and my older brother. Um, my older brother was, he was wonderful. He was really protective and he was, he was a good role model. And he, you know, would occasionally beat the crap out of me. And, you know, what, that's what older brothers do. Um, so Frank is kind of a combination. Jake really is, is a lot the kind of younger brother I was. I was a little more, I held back a little bit more, didn't have a stutter. Um, but I was, I had two older brothers, so I was always the tag along. So I would stand back and watch and all of that. So I'm a little more like Jake than Frank. 
Yeah. A couple more questions. What do I read for mysteries? Oh boy, I'm all over the place. Okay, so as I was telling some folks earlier today, there's a confession coming from a mystery writer. Before I wrote mysteries, I didn't read them. Yeah, really, seriously. I didn't even read the Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew growing up. That was my father's influence, the high school English teacher. I grew up on the literature with a capital L. Um, so uh, so when, I, uh, when I decided I was going to be a mystery writer, I had a lot of catching up to do. So when I read, still when I'm reading today, I love to go back and catch up on those classics I haven't read. Uh, so I still read a lot of Dashiell Hammett and uh, Raymond Chandler and James M. Cain and John D. MacDonald. But if I'm reading somebody contemporary, you know, one of the things I love about the mystery community across the, this country is we all know each other. It's a very small community. So any mystery, with the exception maybe of Grisham, any mystery writer that you name, I probably know pretty well. Uh, so these are all my friends, but I read James Lee Burke, if you know James Lee Burke's work, Tony Hillerman, he's why I do what I do, uh, Dennis Lehane, if you don't know Dennis Lehane's name, think Gone Baby Gone, Shutter Island, um, Mystic River, great writer, Michael Connolly, uh, C.J. Box, uh, uh, Craig Johnson, Margaret Cole, these are some of the people I read these days. I read a lot the people who, who do what I do who write profoundly out of a sense of place. And give, so, boy, you got me started. Here I go. So how many of you know the name Tony Hillerman? How many don't know the name Tony Hillerman? OK, for those of you who get out. No, I'm just kidding. For those of you who, who don't know who Tony Hillerman was, he was uh, an icon in the mystery genre. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. But Hillerman created a, a series of books that were based in the Four Corners area of the Southwest and dealt significantly with the Navajo culture. He was the first guy who kind of opened the door for all of us to write about a culture that was a minority culture. Um, and I had the opportunity of hearing, uh, hearing Tony Hillman's editor, a guy named Eamon Dolan, speak once. And in the course of that, that speech, he threw out this term that he had coined himself. And the term was domestica exotica, domestica Exotica. And what uh, Eamon Dolan's meant by that was, he said, American readers love Domestica Exotica. They love to read a story that's set somewhere in the confines of the United States, so it's domestic, but it's about a place they don't really know, so it's an exotic place to them. He said, readers love to have a, a writer take them to a place they don't know well and give it to them in such a way that when they finish that story, it feels to them like they've been there. So those are the kind of writers, I, I hope I'm that kind of writer, and those are the kind of writers I like to read. One more question, one more question, way over here. What about the character Bobby Cole? How does he live in Yeah, what do you think happened to Bobby? Oh, I would like to think that too. So the question is, what about Bobby Cole? What's up with Bobby Cole? Because I bring him into the story, he gets the story going, but we never really find out what happened to Bobby Cole. Bobby Cole is what in the business we call a MacGuffin. Anybody know what a MacGuffin is? Okay, MacGuffin, okay, you know what a MacGuffin is. MacGuffin is a term that was coined by Alfred Hitchcock. And Alfred Hitchcock said, okay, all, most of my films have a MacGuffin. And a MacGuffin is simply something that gets the story moving, but isn't really central to everything that happens in the movie. So Bobby Cole, gets the story going. What was it that happened to Bobby Cole? But we lose that because what's more important are all the other things that happen. But the story, if you read Ordinary Grace, for me the story really hooks the reader at the point where we come in and Doyle and those guys are sitting drinking beer in the, in the uh, drugstore and Doyle says, something not right about that kid's death. And suddenly, the reader's going, whoa, maybe, maybe there's something more going on here than meets the eye. Maybe, and so there's suddenly a cloud of suspicion has arisen and hangs over the story. So Bobby, Bobby Cole is a MacGuffin. And I choose to believe too, as Frank chooses to believe at the end, that there wasn't anything untoward about his death. He was simply the kind of kid who could, in fact, get so involved that he didn't see the train coming. But who knows? <laughs> You know, folks, uh, one more thing I want to say to you before I close up. You know, I, 
I've been doing this a long time, uh, at like 18 years now, something like that, and, uh, and I do lots of events. But in the beginning of my experience, I had the same experience that most writers have at the beginning of their, of their careers, in that it, it's not, it wasn't uncommon then for me to put together an event, a book signing, you know, like three, four hours away from the Twin Cities, somewhere way out, and I would drive all the way out there, and the only ones present at that signing would be the bookseller, me, and the bookseller's cat, you know? <laughs> so I began, I began a, a, a little ritual that I follow to this day. I began, before I did an event, to say a little prayer. It's a very simple prayer. It goes like this. Please, Lord, let there be people. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thanks folks for showing up today. Give this a minute, and there it is. Um, thank you, Kent. Wonderful presentation. <laughs> Kent's going out to the lobby. He'll be available to sign any copies of the books that you've brought with you. He has copies. I, I know he sold a lot of copies before um, he got started with his presentation, so I think he still has some more books to sell if you're interested in any of those. Um, one thing we're asking is that if you value an event like this, the One Book, One Community, annually, we're asking for support by making a free will do donation or offering in the box in the entrance. Or if you need to think about it and um, contact anybody, Pam at the library or um, anybody connected with Heart of Hutchinson, we'd certainly welcome those donations. We've been very fortunate in getting um, grants for the last two years for like uh, the event, but we have to um, put ourselves in a situation where we can support next year's event. So we're hoping that we're talking to the people that are interested in doing this and are willing to support it in the future. Um, the winners of our drawing are Mary Peschke. Okay, I've got your book up here, Mary, and Roxy Lover. Okay, thank you for coming.